So to begin with, I'd like to uh, ask Jerry to Jerry Alsford to introduce himself um, and then give a give us a brief explanation regarding what is Innovative Farmers and who are the funders that support them. Over to you, Jerry. Okay, Evan. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm Jerry Alford. I am one of the farming advisors at the Soil Association. One of the organisations we're involved with is Innovative Farmers. And from a personal point of view, um, for those who haven't met me, I am a retired farmer um, from Devon. Um, my own farming system was based around no-till and or min-till until I went to organic. And I've been really keen to find some way that we, as organic farmers, can incorporate no-till or low-till systems into organic to move away from this practice of dependency on a plow um, and look at the opportunities that are being found by the farmers. Innovative Farmers um, is, as it names, and I'll talk a bit through the point of this trial, is the point behind Innovative Farmers, if you get groups of farmers who've all got a similar idea as to what we can do, by coming together, they often do work on their own. They often do it as unreported, and they often even forget which part of the field they've tried a bit on. So with, with IF, what we do is pull together a researcher and make sure someone is in the background to nag people to make sure to record data and to make sure things are happening. By putting together a proper orientated trial with a researcher, what it means is we can actually get some sort of really relatively scientifically accurate data to come forward. So Dan, if you want to click the next one. Should be working with the scientific system. You're frozen, Dan. Dan was uploading a big file this morning, so it was a, his internet was a little bit slow, but um, okay. I'm, I'm sure it'll flick over Can in a second if you want to carry on. Yeah, so um, the idea behind IF is really to try and make sure that any results that, gets, that we generate get proper spread throughout the press into farmer groups, into the press, into farmers, and becomes accepted that some practice that maybe my dad used to do or my grandfather used to do actually still has validity in a world in which we're being pressurized to go in certain directions. So IF itself, since 2012, we've done over 100 farmer-led projects. We've, we've awarded over 300,000 pounds worth of funding and assisting farmers through this makes the ideas a reality. So. At the moment, we have more than 300 farms actively involved. We're in the process of setting up a series of more trials, and um, that number will get bigger and bigger. So you're part of a very growing thing. Dan, next one, please. Now, for this, we are totally indebted to the financial support that we have. Um, and our main sponsors, as well as within Innovative Farmers, which is Dutchies Originals, Princes of Wales Charitable Foundation. Um, Innovative Farmers is also supported by Organic Research Centre. And this particular trial is supported by ORC, Cotswolds Grass Seeds to support with the seed, Organic Arable, who um, have supported this financially, and AHDB, who are one of our main funders, are also supporting this and providing for Paul. Um, that's about it for me. What I have to do is I have to apologise because I have to drop out of this um, meeting at some point because I'm on a European conference as well. So I'm going to, go to Denmark in, five, in half an hour. So I hope you have the rest of the meeting very well. Okay, Dan. Thank, thanks, Jerry. That's great. Thanks for that thorough explanation. That's good. That gives us a good insight and leads on nicely um, to the next part. What I'd like to do is just go through and just introduce everybody else that uh, is in this meeting, so you all know who's there. Um, if you can just uh, once I once you hear your name, if you can maybe just um, give a brief background to yourself and, like I say, where you're located, your name as well. That'd be great. So, in no particular order, Dan. Um, Dan, you're behind the scenes. Do you want to just uh, introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are? I'm very excited about this field lab because there seems to be a lot of attention going on across Twitter and across the farming community. So, uh, yeah, I'm, my, my job is about trying to communicate the stories 
uh, why there's a kind of farming community, more people get involved in farm-led research. Um, and also, so yeah, so I won't be in touch later on with the um, with okay. individuals of, in the group um, to discuss uh, some other comms outputs that we might do. And, and if you guys can tweet and kind of keep keep on the tweeting as much as possible, that's great. It keeps on telling us talking about the story about the benefits of of the model, really, um, of um, of both innovative farmers and also um, the practices that you guys are researching. So yeah, that's that's me. Well, thanks, Dan. Cat. Hello there. Um, I work also for the Soil Association um, and uh, for the purpose of, of this, I'm um, the technical support. So I'm hoping everyone can hear and see. Um, uh, so and I'll be taking questions today. Thanks, Kat. Dominic, you there, Dominic Amos? Yeah, I'm there. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dominic Amos, apologies, but my laptop doesn't have a working camera. Um, so I'm sorry you can't see me today, but uh, I am a crops researcher working at the Organic Research Centre, which is based out of Sirencester. Um, although I'm working from home at the moment, and I live in West Oxfordshire in Whitney, so I'm uh, acting as researcher for this, for this trial and, and others within the Innovative Farmers Programme. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dominic. Um, Clive. Clive Bailey, are you there? Uh, yeah, is that working? Is that unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, Yeah, so I'm, I'm a farmer from um, uh, Litchfield, uh, which is in Staffordshire. We farm combinable crops at, at quite large scale. Um, we're not organic. We're a conventional farm in the true sense of the word, but we've been using uh, conservation agriculture, regen ag, um, no-till, whatever you want to frame it up or call it type system for about the last 15 years now. Uh, so, yeah, I've got kind of involved in this from an idea that's been floating around for the last two or three years, really, of if we start to lose more of our actives, glyphosate in particular, what would be our next step? How would we kind of transition into still being able to keep with the, the benefits we've seen from the conservation agriculture and the, and the no-till, um, you know, without needing to return to kind of uh, intensive cultivation and also how do we create the fertility that we need without livestock in a in a kind of uh, an arable system as well. well thanks for that Clive. Um, Jamie Hobbs. Jamie you there? Hi there yeah I'm a mixed farm. Um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Hey, yeah we can hear you that's great. I'm Farmer from sunny Worcestershire. We're growing oats, barley, and beans at the moment, but it's all pretty dry over here, so that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, might be a, a sort of theme that runs through today. I think. Yeah. Um, no, that's brilliant. Thanks, Jamie. Great job. Whereabouts are you based? Worcestershire, near Evesham, um, Perthshire way. So. Right. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Jamie Stevens. Well, oh, hello. Yeah, uh, I'm about uh, three miles from Young Master Hobbs there. Um, it is dry, yes. Uh, we're both organic, uh, uh, sheep and cereals. And yeah, I tried um, a couple of years ago or last year, a couple of years ago to do no-till organic strip tilling uh, with various bits of homemade kit. Didn't go quite so well as I'd like, um, <laughs> understatement. Uh, but I uh, want to give it a go. Very interested in trying to keep a green cover, better, more uh, availability of grazing for sheep, um, adding nutrients back into the ground all the time, uh, reduce tillage, cost saving, environmental benefits, the whole lot. I'm very excited. I'd like to get some blighted though, but it, <laughs> I haven't managed anything yet. So, um, yeah, I've got to hoe my crop that's uh, it's in spring wheat at the moment. I can get it, get and hoe it hopefully in the next... Uh, when the crop's big enough to take the, the hoe um, and then I'll plant my um, uh, my mulch as and when if there's going to be some rain forecast please <laughs> yeah fingers crossed maybe yeah. maybe we need to learn how to do a rain dance or something I think at the moment with, with the outlook yeah. coming but that's brilliant thanks yeah <laughs> um, Mark Lee Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Morning, yep. yep. Morning, yeah. Organic farmer from Shropshire, East Shropshire, mixed farm, um, cattle, sheep and arable. Uh, this is something that I have been thinking, like everybody else, thinking about for a while. This felt like the year that I had to try it 
um, so delighted when I stumbled into the fact that uh, we were all thinking the same way and really pleased to be a part of it. Great job, thank you for that. Um, Matt, Matt Radford. Hello. Hi, Matt. Can you hear us? We're, we're muted. Um, yeah. I'm Matt. This is my father, Mike. We farm, Hi, Mike. Organ we farm or, organically, um, predominantly organically in Cambridge um, with a mixed system with cattle and cereals. We grow mostly for seed. Um, we've been working on uh, organic no-till for or direct drilling into mulches for, for a couple of three years with varied successes. We've, we have managed to take a crop to harvest, but um, there's been more whole cropping than harvesting on the, as a rule. So this is obviously something that we wanted to, to continue pursuing. We think it's quite a viable option for us, particularly with um, having continuous cropping rather than having to have long lay breaks. And um, obviously the other advantages in cost savings and potentially from, from an environmental point of view as well. Thanks, Matt. That's great. It's good uh, to have you both on. Um, we've just heard from uh, five of the six farmers who are um, actively involved in this um, undertaking this project on their farms. Um, unfortunately, James Alexander couldn't be with us today. He's a six farmer, um, which uh, he's a conventional farmer and also has an organic as well, I think. So, um, but unfortunately just couldn't make today and he sends his apologies. Um, now going on to uh, to other group members of our, um, of the art, our, our, um, group uh, for this uh, Innovative Farmers project. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Pawsey. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm John Pawsey from Suffolk. Um, uh, we're organic mixed farmer farmers. We also contract farm for other people as well. Um, as, as Mark said, you know, it's been something that I've been thinking about for a long time and we've sort of dipped our toe in the water over the last two or three years. I was involved with the original no-till um, uh, Nifted Farmers project a while ago, uh, but started it in a way that really wasn't sustainable. And so that's why we're looking at a sort of a different way of doing it, which is um, uh, along the lines of the living mark. So really um, pleased to hear what everybody else is doing. That's great. Thanks, John. It's great to have you on board. Um, and um, Marcus, going to Marcus Struthers next. Marcus, you've sent me a few things. It's great uh, that you've raised your head um, of interest here towards this project. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Marcus Struthers. I uh, work at Cornell Farms. Uh, I'm the arable manager here. Um, yeah, we're sort of looking more to go towards the conservation ag and Sort of we trialled a bit um, last uh, last year, and uh, we've quite sort of well, at the minute quite a bit of success with it. So uh, we're sort of looking to carry that on. And when I sort of got straight into your group, um, I was uh, really really interested to see what other other people were doing um, to just spend a bit more knowledge and help manage it and going forward really. Great, thanks, Marcus. It's great to have you on board. I mean, we're going to look at a few few of your pictures that you sent in um, a bit later, I think. So uh, that would be uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, Sam, Sam Lane, are you here? Um, quite honestly, I, I know that uh, we've spoken. You are integrated in some of these trials. I should have mentioned that, but um, you're doing various other things that are uh, trials that are very relatable to this project. Sam. Obviously, Sam's not with us. Kat? Can you hi, hear me? Sam, I think you're muted. Ah. Yeah, there you go. That's, hi, Sam. Okay, hi there. Morning, morning, team. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, Sam's Sam. got four seats. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, fine. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, so, two strands really. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've had quite a few conversations about this idea of a living mulch um, over the phone through the office, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's great to see that we're bringing people together with the same idea. And then the other strain would be that we are, we've got a small experimental farm which we've been playing around with this idea of under sowing and, and Varex drilling into mulches as well, yellow truffle, white clover. So sort of two areas there that we've got a bit of experience with we might be able to add a few interesting points to. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. That's a great job. 
Um, then last but no means least, William Waterfield. William, it's great to have you on board. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I'm a consultant uh, predominantly in the organic sector uh, for the last 20 odd years. Um, I'm fascinated by how we try to become more sustainable, particularly um, around some of our crop production. And so I've been involved with field labs over the years, mainly in the livestock sector, um, but I can't get away from my arable roots, um, having been brought up on a, a very heavy farm in East Suffolk uh, more years ago than I care to remember. Um, and trying to persuade clients to become more sustainable and less input is really difficult without uh, good information. So I look forward to see what comes out of this and how we get involved in this project. Brilliant, thank you, William. Um, Kat, have I missed anyone? Did we hear from Adam Slate? Adam, are you there? I am, hi, how are you doing? Hi, sorry, um, Adam. I'm... Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm not a farmer, so I'm a bit of an outlier. I work for a company called Vinescapes, and we undertake research and uh, provide advice to people who are planting or establishing vineyards or, or building wineries. Um, I also sit on um, an advisory panel with Sustainable Wines of Great Britain, uh, aiming to set up a sustainability certification for uh, our industry. Um, and um, Things like cover cropping and no-till, no not so much, but um, cover cropping into rows and mulching uh, are kind of very interesting in the viticultural world at the, at the moment as we move away from herbicides. Um, and you guys are probably a little bit ahead of us in terms of your research in the wider kind of agricultural industries. So I'm here to kind of uh, do a bit of spying, basically, and find out what you're up to and see if I can kind of take a bit of lead from the good work that you're doing and try and kind of cross-pollinate into what we're doing. That's great, Adam. Thank you. I mean, it's really interesting that uh, you're coming from it from a different sort of different angle and uh, that it can integrate quite nicely into um, other sectors within the farm, you know, that's related to the farming uh, industry. Um, anyone else, Kat, that I've missed? Uh, Alice is with us. Alice. From Alice. Tom's Garden. Sorry, Alice. Go ahead. Morning. Yeah, Alice Dyer here um, and I write for Farmers Guardian and Arable Farming Magazine. So I'm looking forward to um, yeah, hearing all about this. That's great. Welcome. Welcome to the meeting, Alice. It's great to have you here. Um, that's brilliant. OK, uh, if, if there's nobody else, um, then oh, sorry. Uh, we'll move. Sorry, I couldn't see her name, but there's but Becky's also on the line. From, oh, uh, right. I can farmers. see that. No. Becky. Welcome. Hi, hi, thanks. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm the Innovative Farmers Network coordinator. Um, so I'm in touch a lot with um, with Paul and Dominic and sometimes with the rest of the group as well. Um, and yeah, I just help um, get field labs off the ground and um, help them through the process. Thanks. Brilliant. Welcome, Becky. Sorry I missed you. I, I couldn't see you on my screen here. Um, with that, we're, we'll move on. Hopefully, I've got everybody now. Um, that's quite a big list of people, but it just gives you a good idea of who's who's there and who's listening, um, et cetera, and whereabouts uh, people are based and what they're doing. Um, so with that, I'd like to sort of move, uh, return to Dominic, really, Dominic Amos, um, and invite him to discuss the fundamental trial design associated with this no-till with living mulch project and why this research is so relevant to both the conventional and organic farming sectors. Dominic, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I'm just going to give uh, a little bit of background towards the whole thing um, and then go on to a few sort of key concepts for how um, the farmers are going to try and make the system work. Um, so actually, thanks, Adam, for your kind of leading introduction because um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to start with was that actually this sort of approach with living mulches um, is reasonably common within perennial cropping. So I've got their top fruit of uh, viticulture too. Um, the main reason is because there's a lower risk, obviously, from the from the cover crop. Um, you know, in terms of yield reduction for the for the cash crop. 
Um, but the whole system that we're talking about now is, is can be thought of as a sort of move towards perenniality, at least in terms of soil cover um, anyway. And as others have already said, there are certain farming systems already trying to employ this approach. So within regenerative agriculture, um, you know, looking at relay cropping, trying to keep the soil as covered for as, for as long as possible, um, you know, and the benefits that ensue. So, um, you know, in terms of reducing tillage for the organic farmers involved in, in terms of reducing sort of chemical inputs, um, you know, for the no-till conventional farmers involved, um, you know, both those, both those approaches we know have benefits. Um, now also, there are several kind of um, aspects, you know, there are aspects of the system um, that, that several sort of common practices and um, concepts uh, you know already exist within agriculture and it's it's about taking the knowledge that the farmers already have and applying these um for this new system so again we already had mentioned today cover cropping um and intercropping either sort of relay um one after the other or or, or simultaneously um establishing cover in a cap at the same time um and a cash crop sorry uh and uh, under sowing is quite a common technique mulching is quite a common technique within agriculture so um i suppose the question is how do we apply these to an annual arable um cropping system and one of the potential answers looks to be forage legume covers um you know as an alternative and sustainable strategy for for, for weed control um and for um nitrogen supply and those are the two main um agri system services so as you can see there on the next slide um you know we're looking at the importance of nitrogen accumulation from the forage legume um and how this may help reduce supply extra nitrogen for organic systems and reduce um fertilizer inputs for the for the non-organic systems um we're looking for a weed suppression service from the mulch um hopefully in reducing weeds we can improve the organic yields um, and potentially reduce herbicide applications within non-organic farming um, and they're the two main services we're really looking for from the from the living mulch um, but on top of that we also have uh, you know enhanced um, soil physical physical characteristics um, and uh, improvements in soil biotic health as well um, we can um, we can also see that the living mulch is going to act um, as a kind of catch catch cropping. Um, we know we can get self-regulation of pests and diseases from this kind of approach and improved um, diversity. And uh, again, increase biological diversity both above and below ground. Um, and the reason we're looking at forage legumes is because of that niche complementarity and facilitation. So you're really looking at functional biodiversity. So, um, you know, the combination of the cereal crop um, and, uh, and the legume for maximum benefit. Yeah, so the actual experiment um, itself then, so uh, we're looking at this new living mulch system um, and the, the living mulch that's being trialled uh, on the farms um, is a composition of wild white clover and medium leafed clover. Uh, we've selected that with the help of um, Sam at, at Cotswold Seeds, uh, who's given us some great advice about you know what what composition and um, seed rate maybe makes the most sense in trying to get this system to work. Um, all the farmers are going to be comparing their new living mulch system to a farm control. Um, in terms of the data that we're going to collect. Uh, we'll look at ground cover surveys, uh, biomass cuts where appropriate for the um, cash and cover crop and for the weeds. Um, we'll be looking at nutrient content of the soils and of um, cash crop tissue. Uh, of course, the cash crop yields and um, grain quality analysis. And uh, you know, hopefully, the experiments themselves across the farms will help establish and you know quantify the effects of, of the new living mulch system. Uh, and that, as I mentioned already, so that living mulch uh, composition um, we put together by Cotswold Seed. So there's a number of uh, qualities that those different species provide, um, you know, in terms of persistence and, and that make them look like 
uh, you know, they're appropriate to get this system to work. And, um, you know, in terms of the kind of biomass that you're going to get from them, not too high in order to offer too much competition against the against the cash crop, but high enough that um, hopefully they give you enough competition against weeds, which is one of the key services you're looking for. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I suppose the, the, in summary, in the key to success really is about you know handing that um, cereal crop the competitive advantage within the system. Um, and I mean, you can look at that from two perspectives. One is about boosting the cash crop and the other is about weakening the cover crop um you know and the whole thing will come down to the dynamics between between the cash crop and the cover crop and the weeds of course and it's a very fine balancing act um as already mentioned there's also a, a quite a large trade-off between the two um major services you want the living mulch to provide that's nitrogen accumulation and weed suppression which are directly linked a positive correlation with the biomass of the mulch but um, that also then increases the more biomass um, you have with the mulch, then you're also increasing uh, the competition against the cash crop and, um, you know, liable to then reduce yield. Um, one of the key kind of findings from research that's, that's been done really is that there needs to be this proper spatial arrangement um, between cash and cover crop establishment and then um, during growth and development of the cash crop. So in trying to uh, look a bit closer into um, you know, the, the aspect of boosting the, the cash crop, um, so these are generally the sort of options available to farmers um, you know, in terms of the decision. So you're looking firstly at, at the species um, and which ones are likely to be more vigorous than others. Um, you know, species like rye have very high competitive ability um, against weeds and, and, and would also against the mulch. Um, obviously, you've got them um, within species. You've got varietal differences. Different genotypes will offer um, different amounts of competition uh, in terms of their growth habits and height. Um, improving competitive ability uh, you then obviously got a difference between either spring type or winter type um, and you've got the options um, there so spring types generally more vigorous and they have a shorter growing season so they, they move through the growth stages quicker however you have to think about the timing of um, sowing your cash crop and actually in the spring they may be good reasonable conditions for um, vigorous crop growth, but they're also going to be good conditions for the mulch. So at the time when the cereal crops growing and developing, the living mulch is also um, is also growing and that then maybe leads um, towards the idea that, that an autumn zone um, you know, winter crop may make more sense so that you know cereals continue to grow, continue to grow and develop um, and tiller over the winter while the mulch um, while the clovers uh, almost go dormant to an extent or you know their, their growth is slowed right down so that should give um, the cereal crop a slight advantage for a few months um, over the winter. Uh, I already mentioned there about uh, the spatial arrangement so it does look quite important um, to be able to keep the mulch and the cereal crop um, as separate as possible for as long as possible. Um, of course, that's another trade-off between not fully covering the ground, um, which is one, you know, one approach you want in order to maximise the benefits of having a having a mulch cover, um, but providing a strip or a channel, a band for the for the cash crop to grow and develop in looks to be an important part of um, not providing too much competition to, to suppress yields too far. Um, so again, in terms of uh, the sort of second main aspects um, in weakening the mulch and the weeds. So within the crop, um, you have obviously varieties and species and varieties of selection. Well, that's that's taken care of with um, the advice from, from Cotswold and the option that we've gone with, with that wild white and um, medium, medium leaf white clover. Um, again, back to that spatial distribution. Um, so separating the mulch um, from, the, from the cereal crop. Uh, the non-organic farmers do have the options um, of nitrogen, which hands a competitive ability 
to the cereal crop. Um, it's you know it's better at better at taking up nitrogen, more efficient at taking up nitrogen than the than the legume. Um, and also potentially the use of herbicides just to knock back the clover a bit. Um, again, handing the advantage back to the cereal crop. Um, you know, the big question mark is around this inter-row mowing as an approach. Um, and we're discussing at the moment with um, you know, agricultural engineers and some of the farmers about you know, producing a machine um, that might enable sort of testing this or a, a sort of prototype to see you know, how effective that can be, but it may be the only in-crop um, management that, that the farmers will be able to perform to, um, certainly for the organic farmers, to be able to um, reduce the biomass of the living mulch and enable, um, you know, the cash crop to, to get away. Um, and then obviously, once you've harvested your cash crop, then you've got the options of grazing or mowing to knock back your mulch before then, um, Drilling, drilling the subsequent crop. Uh, and next, next slide, please, Dan. Yes, yeah, so this is just a focus, I suppose, trying to, trying to emphasize the point about um, providing a bit of space for that, um, you know, germinating and establishing cereal, um, certainly during the foundation phase, but potentially even beyond. Um, into the construction phase to keep it as, as um, free of any competition for as long as you can. And we know about weed free, um, critical weed free periods and they can, um, they can last from germination right the way through to anthesis. So the longer you can give the, the crop um, some space to grow and develop, the better really in terms of not risking too high a um, yield reduction. You can see that photo on the right where there's competition both above and below ground. Um, for resources and it might be hard for the cereal crop to compete um, effectively. And fi finally down the last last slide, yeah, so in summary, I think certainly for, for the farmers, um, and it'd be really interesting to hear from all those taking part, um, part of it's about sort of acceptable yield loss because we've, we've highlighted many of the benefits from this kind of system, um, but it is likely to lead to um, a reduction in yield. So how how much of a yield loss is acceptable and, and um, how much are the farmers willing to tolerate? Um, the success of the system may come down to your kind of weed community and weed burden. Um, and we know that, you know, probably a lot of grass weeds is going to make the system difficult to manage. Um, they're occupying the same, you know, that same niche as the, as the cereal crop. Um, so the same reason that you can expect cereal to be able to function and, and prosper within this system means that grass weeds also can. Um, and again, because it's a new cropping system, uh, you know, it needs to be it needs to be a systems approach. And maybe there are certain crops in the current cropping system that, that may not work as well. Um, and that's back to my point about certain um, you know crop vigor and certain species may be better suited than others. Um, and again, just a, I suppose a couple of questions for the farmers there um, in terms of whether the main risk is a yield reduction or whether it's weed competition um, and also what the main targets are from the system um, in terms of yield quality and weed control and, and soil health, um, you know, to help to help plan this approach and um, to think about, in, you know, when it comes to trying to implement this new system. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, together and with this um, um, collective experiment approach, um, you know, we're going to learn, uh, you know, hopefully whether it works, how to apply the system, um, we'll be able to quantify, um, you know, the scale, whether there's an effect and the scale of the effects um, in terms of yield reductions and weed control. Um, and you know, although all these things are always so site specific and um, context specific, that shows the importance of the sort of the local testing, which the farmers are doing. But hopefully, um, you know, there's enough farmers involved that they're also we can take some generalizable findings, um, you know, to help to help other farmers who might be interested in applying this this kind of approach. Um, and I think that's that's pretty much it for me. Well, thanks, Dominic.
that's um i think i think you know you've highlighted a lot and also you know my thoughts from this project um certainly you know with what's going on with farming particularly with integrated pest management or integrated farm management you know that we've all got to be thinking of um this very much fits in nicely with that as well as um, we keep, you know, we must in our background know, I uh, think, be thinking about elms that's uh, on the horizon um, and uh, that's coming off the basis of the government's 25 year environmental plan. So, you know, this project fits very, very nicely into both of those um, to um, help um, farmers think about new strategies to go forward or strategies um, that can fit into their farming system to help it make it make it more robust um, so with that and you know um, linking in you can see on um, the screen um, just an update that uh, you guys that are actively um, undertaking the trial have sent me I don't know whether it's all up to date but what I would like to do is come back to um, the all of the farmers that uh, are leading on this research and just um, hear your thoughts on how the project's going. Some of you have actually done this um, in your introductions, but again, you can reiterate how the project's going on your farms. Um, you will also see some relevant photos from people um, which by all means lead, um, talk about, you can use those to discuss what's happening on your farm or any points you want to raise. Um, it would be uh, good to uh, just highlight again where your farm is, um, just so we all know. Um, also, you know, the drill, uh, the drilling strategies that you utilised, um, what drill you've used, what what has gone well, what hasn't, um, any perceived challenges, and uh, how do you think we, you may overcome these? Um, because obviously there are challenges out there. We're, we're hitting one at the moment with moisture, you know, and we know that climate change is here. It's very unpredictable and we've got to overcome that with everything that we do. So it'd be very much uh, very interested to hear that. And also some of Dominic's questions at the end there, you know, your main objectives of yield, quality, weed control, or soil. What is your main objective? at the end of the day um, and how much yield you know do you think doing something like this um, and lowering you with lower inputs will uh, be adequate enough to um, compensate if you do get any yield loss because we know that uh, variety and genetics will change in within the uh, field of um, of what we're planting um, and the crops that we're using. So with that, if you just bear with me, I'll just go down through quickly. Clive, um, uh, uh, you know, you've heard what's going on. What's your thoughts and how's things going with you? Uh, sorry, yeah, um, right. Oh, oh, sorry, um, are we going to do it on an order of the, of the slides or are we going on order? Of yeah, sorry, order? Who, sorry, who have you got first off? Mark Lee, sorry, got, Clive. Yeah, sorry, Clive. Um, yep, sorry, Mark Lee. Right, Mark, can you hear me? Yeah, Mark, how, how good to, sorry, I missed, uh, didn't realise that we were, had to do your slide first. How's things going? Do you want to just expand well, we, on some I've of those questions? Clover, so I'm feeling uh, slightly embarrassed by that in front of everybody else. I don't know how we've managed to have that. We, we feel, uh, it seems to me to be as dry here as anybody else, everywhere else. Um, I think we must have just been fortunate. Um, we have both our crops in and they are both up. Um, I can find clover in both fields. The winter wheat, um, I think, is decreasing now. I think we're losing the, the mulch to some extent. Um, the, that is winter wheat sideways on. And, and the, as you can see, there is clover there. It was never at a high rate. My worry with the winter wheat was that it's a heritage wheat, so it's tall anyway. Um, our wheat is quite good. It was sown in October and, and the wheat is quite strong and it hasn't suffered too much with lack of moisture. The clover obviously has, but it is there and it is growing. So I've got some cause for hope. The spring crops were, what we did, we sowed the spring oak, spring wheat rather, and in our normal under sowing style, we do a lot of under sowing every year. And in the normal pattern, we let the wheat get away about a month. Um, I then sowed buckwheat, which we are developing as a combinable crop here as well and we sowed the under sow the same day as the buckwheat. So we drilled the buckwheat um, with a combination drill and then I went over with uh, a broadcaster and broad we harrowed the wheat the same day um, in adjacent plots, the spring wheat, 
I then broadcast the clover seed over the two plots and rolled it behind. So the clover went in the same day as the buckwheat in the belief that the buckwheat will be extremely strong, normally is, um, and to give the clover a fighting chance, it needed to get away the same day, where uh, obviously in the wheat, we wanted the wheat to have a head start. But they're both, the first slide that you put up there showed the buckwheat with clover coming up together. How, I don't know, but they are both coming up. Um, there seems to be enough plants. The two and a half kilos to the hectare seem, looks okay. Um, if they survive and they spread, then there certainly looks to be enough white clover plants there. Um, we've got other weed as well in that plot, obviously, because there is no weed control now available in the buckwheat. We can't harrow it for obvious reasons. So I'm hopeful that the combination will suppress weed. The buckwheat certainly should do that. Um, I just hope the buckwheat doesn't suppress out the clover. But um, our normal experience of under sowing is if you can get it to germinate, then it will survive. Here's the start. Anything else? That's, that's brilliant, Peter Wheat. Mark. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark, sorry, Mark, just to go back, um, what uh, will be your next crop that you'll be drilling into the mulch? We are thinking of winter oats into both blocks. I, when, I mean, I'm being very selfish in a way in that I've spoken to people who've done this before or tried, some of whom are with us today, and I'm trying to learn what they've already learned and give us the best chance. So we are applying what Dominic just mentioned. We're going to put winter cereals into our into our mulches rather than spring to give us potentially the best chance for that cereal um, in October to get it away while the mulch is relatively dormant. So uh, in both cases, I'm intending to put winter oats in. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Thanks, Mark. That's great. Just, we'll move um, on to. Sorry, go Sorry, on. Can I, we've just got a question um, yep. uh, for Mark. What rate do you sow the buckwheat at, please? The buckwheat was sown slightly lower, um, about 50 kilos to the hectare. We, that's a slightly reduced rate. This is very new to us as well. We're, it's only our second year of buckwheat trial, buckwheat, combining buckwheat trials. Um, so where I would have gone more like 70 kilos to the hectare of buckwheat, we dropped that back a bit again to give the clover uh, a bit more of a chance to, to, to survive underneath what will be a very strong canopy. Thank you. Cat, any more? That's... Uh, William, did you have one for Mark? I, or was that just a private message? No, it was coming. I hit the return key when I shouldn't have done. I was okay. going to ask Mark. <laughs> usual thumbs and problem um, <laughs> just thinking ahead really for mark and wondering whether if he establishes his clover whether he would graze that before he tries to establish next year's crop to take yep. some bigger out of the clover sheep are part of our part of our plan my main priority is weed control um, i don't know whether we will all feel all the non all the sorry the organic farmers will feel the same but Weeds are my yield limiting factor most years here, maybe not this year, but most years they are. Um, and we need to work out ways of stopping particularly annual weeds, particularly charlock um, and brassica weeds, other brassica weeds. We need to break the cycle that we're stuck in, plowing brassica weed seeds down and up again. Um, so the main priority for me is controlling the germination of brassica weed seeds annual germination of brassica weed seeds that we suffer with. Um, now, whether or not, we know that this will do it, but it's whether or not the, the yield penalty on the, the cereal obviously will be too serious to, to see this as a way to avoid the, uh, the cultivation, which will lead to the brassica weed germination. Sheep, the answer to your question, yeah, sheep, it'll be sheep straight on, I think, if there's, an, well, as soon as there's enough to graze, we will graze in the winter, um, potentially, even after we've sown the oats, a little maybe. I don't know. Sheep don't. I think sheep don't tend to graze oats very well. John would know. Um, if they don't, then maybe we'll be able to just nibble the clover even even after the crop is up. It's certainly around about the point of sowing. Thank you. 
Okay, and shall we just move on, just conscious of time, because uh, um, we want to sort of round up around 11.30ish. Uh, um, so, Clive, over to you this time. Is you. Right, I, I think maybe um, to answer some of the questions that Dominic posed, it'd be helpful if I talked about some of the history, really, and how we've kind of got here, and some of the things that we've trials and things we've tried in the past. Um, the kind of the, the journey from a purely uh, heavy tillage um, combinable crops farmer to the conservation ag system has, has involved like a relearning of farming, and along that road, there's been you know kind of a quest for knowledge from other people. And the reason that I find the organic side so interesting is what I've learned in the last you know certainly the last five or six years is i found that actually there's more to learn from the organic guys when it comes to the conservation agriculture than there is from conventional um arable which is very synthetic and biased and isn't considering that things like the companion cropping and the, the relay cropping the fertility building stages so to that end over the last few years we've and we still do we we grow some companion crops we do some relay cropping um moisture particularly this year is one of the key reasons I, I i came to this you know back 15 years ago and started playing around with it um was this this american and hotter warmer countries idea of keeping a constant soil armor as they call it there to kind of reduce evaporation and, and hold as much moisture as possible and that's something we've benefited from by leaving residues on the surface but the i say downside as you build soil biology through less disturbance the amount of worms that you that you start to build actually work against this because no matter how much trash i leave on the surface the 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 worm numbers grow you know have increased to a point where they take it down so i um i was looking at ways of getting other ways of getting that soil armor and to have that kind of that living mulch uh, that the worms won't take down is, is one of the ways you know to, to maybe come to that um yeah, this is to me the 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 kind of the holy grail of of cereal farming i think is if we can combine the benefits of con con conservation agriculture and organic um together i think then we we kind of solve the kind of the downsides that there are with organic and the downsides that there are with, with the conventional um our crop our crop went in on the 27th i think or towards it was the end of march anyway late march uh, into a you know into a crop of wheat that was reasonably well established in early october we inter row sowed it. Um, we're on a 25 centimeter, uh, 10 inch um, row spacing, um, and we basically drilled the the clover at the recommended rate between the rows. It's been desperately dry here since. In fact, I, other than a, a couple of one mil type rain events, I don't think we've actually had any rain at all since then. Wheat and well, all crops are suffering quite badly because of that now. Uh, the clover is, you can find some clover plants, so I have got some clover through. It's a long way from looking like anything was really done intentionally though yet, uh, but that's purely moisture based and there's no other reason for if you got hold of a bit of moisture it would it would get away and grow. Um, quite interested to hear Adam's involvement earlier as well because one of the reasons I can't, one of the things that got me thinking along the, the lines of the, of, the, of the living mulch was visiting agroforestry farms. I've been quite fascinated with, with that kind of concept for years uh, and looked many times at where it's a possibility for us. And I kind of see, I see this as kind of a, this is like a mini agroforestry um, where, you know, the, if you imagine that the wheat plants will be the trees and the living mulch will be kind of that lower story. But what I'm wondering longer term is, can we take this further? Um, could my living mulch and wheat or, or combinable crop mix be grown between rows of trees or I think possibly more realistically for us, I've considered the idea that maybe uh, vineyard um, you know, could be a solution there. So why limit this to just those two stories? Could we go three, four, five, even, you know, can we kind of take this right out? So maybe even you go further than just the kind of vines, you could then go out to rows of trees between the vine, you know, and, and expand it out that way. I think the possibilities of this are quite interesting. Um, We've seen before with um, the companion cropping and the relay cropping that we've done, and that, that second principle of conservation agriculture, which is species maximum species diversity. Well, all farmers think very in a very binary, binary way about that. They think about rotation and just having wider rotations. But actually, if we can grow um, companion crops or relay crops and have you know get away from the monoculture type idea. Um, the advantages towards reductions in use of fungicides um, and, and, and other synthetic inputs seems to follow. I've certainly found that with uh, when we grow pea and rape, for instance, as a companion crop, or, or oats and oats and spring beans together, that 
there becomes no need to use, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be organic, I just don't need to use a fungicide on those crops because they seem to work in a, uh, in a way that protects each other. Um, and there's a, an awful lot to learn on that, I think, going forward. And, and fi finally, like the financially and from a yield loss point of view, um, the thing, the underlying thing I've learned and the biggest transformation to my business through the change to conservation, conservation agriculture has been a massive lowering of my fixed cost structure. And um, that takes us away from the obsession that most of us have, which is yield. It's all about yield. It's all about yield at any cost. And um, if you can keep the fixed cost structure of a business down, then yield actually starts to matter less. So I've already done that with my fixed costs and that's worked very well for us. But the next step for that is if I can take away a lot of these inputs, well, then a yield reduction doesn't matter as well. Um, so I, I, I don't fear that particularly. Um, the big question in my mind is, though, if I if I do reach a point where this is working without nitrogen and herbicides, we've already been insecticide free for the last eight, eight years, I think eight or nine seasons now. Um, actually, I have to start asking the question to myself is, well, why aren't I just organic then? Why don't I do the conversion? <laughs> so it, it kind of it, this, this experiment for me may open off uh, if it works, if it's, if it's very successful, it may fundamentally change whether I call myself a conventional or organic farmer going forward. That's brilliant, Clive. I, I think I think you uh, raised a number of points there, particularly one on each yield king. Um, very much a big discussion that always comes up about this one. Um, or is it uh, the you know lowering your inputs, like you say, and this is what this project's all about, very much uh, potentially to help you do that. It'd be very interesting when we get to John Palsy on your comments about um, you learning from organics, because I know John often says he, he often, uh, looks at the other way around as well. So I think there's a lot to be learned on both sides. Um, I'm just interested, any questions out there, Pat? Yep, William Waterfield. Okay, um, without putting one or failing to put one in the chat. Can I, are you seed dressing free? Yes, yes, we don't. We yeah, we we, we farm save um, all but about five percent of new seeds that we that we bring in um, just for new varieties every year. But yeah, I've used no seed dressing for 12, 13 years now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we seemingly know. But I mean, this 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 fixed cost thing that, that Paul's just mentioned there, it's 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 absolute key. And that I think for the organic uh, farmers amongst this group is is something to focus on. That that the simplicity of a a no tillage conservation ag type system and the massive reductions in labour resource needed and fuel and that kind of thing, those savings are are so significant that that's why um, I, I guess and I mentioned it earlier when I introduced early on that. Um, you know, glyphosate is one of the things that gets you thinking. You know, if if we lose the glyphosate, no-till at the moment is is heavily reliant on glyphosate. It gets you thinking about that. But you know, fundamentally, when I if I if I kind of consider that reality, I also consider the fact that if I had to return to ploughing, I don't see how, with our business structure and and, and costs and, and scale, how I could do that profitably. So. Quite frankly, if we lost glyphosate and there wasn't, and I can't find a new method, I, I'd, I'd probably better off just not farming anymore. Really, it's it's it, it, it. I don't see the point in returning to system where the high fixed cost structure stops you making money before I've even started. Any other questions out there for Clive? Um, Clive, just one one final question. Your soil organic matter. What what was that at the beginning of this, or um, on your farm? Uh, before be when we're cultivating. Yeah. Back. So, the, my, one of my big regrets actually uh, about this whole thing is right at the start, obviously because we didn't realise how transformational things were going to be. We didn't do enough accurate testing at the start. But I have got some inf some data information. Um, also, we farm a lot of. A lot of extra land since then and, and different land but they they were around the kind of two two and a half to three percent type levels um now depending on you know whose test you believe and that's a whole can of worms excuse the pun um but uh you know we tend to get results more in the kind of four four and a quarter four and a half type range so i think probably over 50 10 to 15 years depending on you know we didn't go cold turkey on the whole farm on day one kind of thing um i think we've managed to kind of 
somewhere between a 1.5, you know, maybe in some cases 2% type increase in 15 years, um, which is, you know, obviously good on, on, on many levels. Um, there's other reasons that we were brought in more organic you know, composts and, um, and manures uh, on straw for muck deals and, and chopped for more straw. So, yeah, it's, it's not a, the no-till isn't some kind of silver bullet and people often get a little bit carried away on that. It's part of a system. And that's why I think it's better referred to as those three principles of conservation agriculture. No tillage is only one of those three things. There are two other key important parts, which is the species diversity and the um, constant soil cover. Um, which again, we've grown a lot, obviously cover crops at every opportunity through that 10 to 15 year cycle as well to try and lift those soil organic matters. And, and it's helping. I mean, although we're desperately dry here at the moment, um, you know, there are notable differences between ours and our neighbours' crops right now um, on similar soil types. The, the increase in organic matter is helping to buffer um, and that's like, you know, that better kind of soil cover it is helping, I'm sure. But uh, it's not a silver bullet and it won't protect us if it doesn't rain between now and harvest, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, thanks, Clive. Really good. Really interesting. Well done. Any, uh, Kat, yeah, I think any Dominic final... had a... Yeah, I think Hi, Dominic. Dominic. A Sorry, Dominic. Hi, thanks, Tom. Yeah, just a quick one, Clive. Um, it was about what your, um, I suppose, for the for the winter week, for the for the experiment, what your kind of approach is at the moment with nitrogen and what your strategy is for sort of reducing it. Yeah, so we've decided in, in this first year, um, the plan, well, I mean, obviously, you know, Dominic, the plan originally was to establish the clovers in the autumn, but with such a, you know, lousy um, kind of autumn and winter, establishment opportunities were, were, were difficult. It was a testing season, I think, sorry, the best way to put it. Um, so, um, yeah, we, the, the establishment in the spring wasn't the original plan, but I don't think it's any bad thing. Um, clover, even if it wasn't so dry as it is, is going to take quite a long time to establish a point where it's providing a significant amount of nitrogen for us. So really the plan for this first year for us was to treat um, the, the crop, the whole field, including the trial areas, and there's four one hectare strips in there, um, to, in conventionally in terms of nitrogen, obviously we're, we're not using herbicides on those strips because we don't want to kind of knock the, uh, the, um, the, the, the clovers back. But other than that, Really, my aim for this year one is just to get this, this clover established. I'm not really expecting to see it contributes anything much in the way of nitrogen this year that can mean that we can suddenly cut our rate, rates. Um, if, if this year is the establishment year, I think next year will be the first year that we actually can say, right, let's not fertilise those strips and get those comparisons. Yeah, don't, we... Thank you. That was yeah. No other questions. Thanks. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks, Clive. Um, I see just quickly that we've got Andrew from Organic Arable have joined us. So welcome, Andrew. Um, if you're out there, that's great. Um, right. Let's move on to Mike and Matt Radford. Mike, how you doing? Yeah, I'm well. Yeah, I'm going to hand over to Matt because he's more okay um, on the ball than I'm. Um, so, uh, I think as most people have, or a lot of people have, we established our um, mulches into uh, an autumn sown crop of winter wheat, the photograph which is up there. Uh, we had established clover, We I think we drilled it on the 9th of April. Dominic was here a fortnight ago or so and there was clover visible. I think I said in one of the WhatsApp conversations, our primary concern whenever we establish lays is is water and then a drought, which is exactly what we've had. So a lot of that clover had germinated and I can't find any real trace of it at all now. We've we've definitely had that happen before with, particularly with trefoil, and then we'll, we'll finish harvest and uh, then we have a really good cover. It's the, the these um, small seed undersows for um, into wheat, a, a sort of a well-trodden path for us. We've been using trefoil particularly for about 15 years. So we undersow our first wheats with trefoil in the hope to get 50 or 60 kilos of nitrogen. We destroy that in the autumn uh, and drill a second winter wheat into it. So it allows us to get two winter seed crops from the same same plot of land in the rotation. The this all came about for us really. We uh, in autumn 16 we had a really good trefoil crop um, in a piece of ground. We've been doing continuous wheat cropping 
for 12 years, I think. Mm. Yeah. So we'd, we'd, we'd been having a little three hectare mm. trial where we had grown nothing but continuous mm. winter wheat just to see if we could do it really. And that's been propped up by continuously under sowing with trefoil. Uh, end of harvest year 16, we had a really good crop of trefoil. So we thought we'd have a go. We left that till the spring, grazed it hard and sowed it with Malika, which established well and grew well, but then uh, got droughted out we ended up whole cropping it. I think, not to jump about too much, but our main concern with the, well, our main problem is competition from those uh, under sows, from the from the mulch, if you like, and water. So the, the, the trefoil had a really well-established root system. The Malika didn't, and when it didn't rain, the Malika just was droughted out quite literally. It just couldn't compete. We whole cropped that. The trefoil was still very good in the autumn. So we under sowed that with uh, triticale to try and oh, sorry we direct we direct drilled triticale into that trefoil mulch so the second year and that we took to harvest there was a yield penalty but we saw a protein spike of about a percent and a half compared to the to the control so there's definitely we we, we know we can make it work so this uh, group is a is a really good continuation of that for us we it's something we've been thinking about a lot uh, Jamie and I have talked about it a lot um, he's slightly further ahead than we are in making the mowing work we think that the that the, the need for an inter-row mow with this mulch is essential for us for a weed control um i, I guess similar to clive we're using a, i mean a much older drill but we're using a, a 25 inch uh, sorry 25 mil or 10 inch row center and we sow it generally in a five inch band but we often use a two inch band for for, for establishing beans and so on. So we'll probably go to that if we get the, the mulch established. Um, I, I, the, the challenges with the with the small clover, the small seeds, I know that was it was talked about, the, ta the challenges of getting it established. We, we're sort of hopeful that it might come back as the trefoil sometimes does. The, the seeds there, whatever hasn't germinated, then we have a chance that, that we might find it after harvest, but we're not 100%. I think we definitely need to work on, if we're going to establish these permanent lays, then we need to be cultivating, rolling. I think we, we don't, we want to set our stall out with a very level field with everything we want right before we get going, don't we? I think, that's... Yeah, I think we need to just think much more closely about establishing the, you know, rather than sort of banging it in as an under, so we probably need to treat it as a proper crop yeah. in the autumn. Um, you know, might much the same time as you'd sow all seed rape, for example, and and treat it with much more care, um, and and sort of sacrifice a year's a year's yeah. cash cropping to get it established, or potentially spring crop into it if it's if it's there and working. Mm. We have other, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, not to ramble on, but we, I, I guess, our aims with this. I, I took a few notes of the questions we were asked to ask answer. Um, we're looking for a, potentially an increase in qu crop quality, although we. With our wheat and our oat crops generally we try and grow for seed the challenge for us is in that is where do we get a break so how do we have a break crop so we can continue to grow seed we're looking for reduced costs reduced machinery cost, um, costs particularly but also going back to what we were doing with our early trefoil trials is can we get continuous cropping to work and i think um, as others have, have have talked about we we don't mind losing yield in return for time and money saved. I think we probably reckon we can lose about 20%. If we budget for five tonne a hectare on a winter wheat or a winter oat crop, and we get four, but we save 300 pound in cost, then I'm very comfortable with that. The other other advantage I think is often missed is that you get, in our rotation of a six year rotation, there's two year of lays. If we're cropping for six years, then we're in a better place because we're not sacrificing two years for fertility building. Uh, challenges, I think, for us, for the future, we feel like we need a, a viable inter-row mowing system to make it work. I know the Canadians are working very hard on um, on that. I think they're a step ahead, you know, reading, reading what people are doing. Without that, I think we'll struggle to make it really work for us, because if we can if we can just go in and mow a competitive mulch and just keep it down, a it's going to drop some of its nitrogen and feed the crop, and b we can suppress anything that's becoming too competitive. Poppies and charlock, in particular. particularly poppies and charlock, yeah. 
Um, we we obviously use a comb cut and comb harrow and everything else at the moment for weed suppression. So we'll have to the comb cut will still have a part, but the comb harrow certainly won't. The the other thing we've been thinking a lot about is how our stock fits in because being a mixed farm, we we run a, a beef herd as well as as cereals, and um, we potentially don't have a, a, a place for the cattle if we're not growing grass for silage. Um, and we've got no way of getting rid of muck, then, I mean, uh, there's plenty of people who take muck, but certainly how, how are we going to feed the cattle, where are we going to put the cattle, do we need them? You know, we, as, much as, as much as we like them, is there a place for them anymore? Really? So I think, I hope that gives you a summary of what we're doing, I, if there's any more really. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks um, to both you, Matt and Mike, for that. Um, just out of interest, um, Matt, uh, what will what cash crop will be established into the mulch latter end? What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, the crop there is a is a first winter wheat, uh, crispin, winter wheat. For, um, right. and that's crispin for Warns, uh, for right. Lawrence, uh, and awesome. for seed. And um, the second it will be the same. It will go back into oh, crispin. Okay. So there'll okay. be two. Generally, our rotation at the moment if, is two winter wheat or a winter wheat, winter oat, um, a pulse or hemp, and then um, uh, a, a spring crop to establish a two-year lay. Well, okay, thanks for that. Yeah, it would be quite hard, won't it, to not have livestock in your system? Uh, at the oh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, at the moment it's it's we have about, I mean, as about a third of the farm is down to grass. So the, the cattle, yeah. are, although this year we're, we're already feeding them at grass, so not not ideal conditions for keeping out stock. We mm -hmm. may end up having to reduce that this year just on the mm -hmm. pressures of feeding them. Uh, we, sure. we like them and they're part of the farm, mm -hmm. but there's also mm -hmm. a huge amount of time goes into them in the winter. Sure. Anyone, anyone out there who doesn't keep animals gets three months mm -hmm. off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thanks for that. Kat, I can't see any questions come in my end. Have you got anything? No, I haven't. Okay, no, that's brilliant. Thank you for that. That's great. We'll move on. Dan, have we got? Yep, that's it. Um, so, uh, Jane, Jamie, Jamie yep, Hobbs. This is, this is Hiya. Hi there, this is some um, spring barley, which we've undiscerned. Um, and I, I thought in the one picture you might be able to see a bit of clover, but it doesn't, I, I think my name might be over the top of it. It's um, just below the J, and that took a bit of finding, unfortunately. Um, in the past, we've tried this a few times, and our main problem has been the, um, the clover and trefoil has been too strong to sow into it. This year, that's not going to be a problem. Um, I'm assuming that it'll come in the autumn when it rains, but um, I, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what happens in this circumstance. Um, and the, the, my, I have one question for Sam was how high, if the, if the mulch did come, how high does he think that this would um, end up, the mulch? Um, Sam, do you want to answer that? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, just mind for the photo I took over at Macaroni Farm a few months ago, and it was sort of stubble height, really, not much more than that. The white clover mixture, not not with the trefoil, and just the white clovers in in the trial mix. Uh, so it shouldn't get very high at all, sort of ample height, really. Yeah. Can my, my, plan, the formulation. Yeah. my plan is to um, follow it with um, with winter beans, and I was just hoping that that wouldn't interfere with the harvest, but um. A lot more experienced people than me here with winter beans, so I was just wondering what the what the thought was about that. Yeah, I'd be surprised if you had an issue. I think you'll be fine. I would have thought, especially with a strong growing plant like bean, definitely. Okay. Well, that, that's I'm afraid. As I say, it's, it's very dry here, and we haven't got a lot to show at the moment. But um, hopefully by the autumn, something will be there. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. I've, I've um you know, fingers crossed for a bit of rain. That's what we all could do with. <clears throat> so um, again, um, have, we, uh, have we got any uh, questions there, Kat, come in? We'll Sorry, move no, on. No, I haven't, yep. No, 
we'll move on. Jamie, um, no means last, no means last, but not least. Um, do you want to give us your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Hello. Um, I did send a picture in, but it was of my two seed bags unopened and waiting to be planted. But um, that's not quite as interesting as a bunch of um, uh, crop shots. Um, right. I echo a lot of what people have been saying. Um, uh, my, my experience is of what I tried to do um, was to cut strips into uh, well, a temporary grass, white um, white clover and a red clover lay, two different uh, parts of the field. Um, <clears> I found that I had uh, rye grass in there as well, which I thought might be an issue and everybody told me would be an issue and everybody was right. I couldn't control the rye grass. Um, I adapted a uh, weed surfer as an interro mow, um, which worked okay, but the rye grass kept on coming back into the rows of wheat. Um, which didn't go very well. I couldn't mow that bit out, and um, that was very problematic. And I was mowing every um, every week, really, in late May and June. So I'd be interested to see with Sam's uh, with, with this uh, wild clover and smaller clover lays whether they were anywhere near as competitive. Obviously, the ryegrass was a big no-no. Shouldn't have done it, but I was where I was. Um, echoing what Clive was saying about um, looking at what America's doing. Um, couldn't agree more with that. And I think John Palsy was talking about something like it the other day on, I think it's a farming forum, about um, American strip till cultivator machines. Um, I think that's a good shout. Um, I think whether we need to be um, very much like uh, Mark, uh, Matt was saying, sorry, um, that we need to be treating the crop, the underlay as a, as a, as a proper crop but also having it separate in strips. I certainly, when I plant mine, won't undersow it. I'll be planting it in a designated strip. I'm on 360 centers. So I've given it plenty of room to get lots of light into it and grow and try to keep the crop separate. Um, ideally in probably at 150 mil wide strips, um, I found that cultivating those strips out and drilling it does throw a lot of soil about and you get to lose the soil from the strips which is a bit irritating and um, then you have to get the soil back in again so that's that's a bit of a trouble but these american machines they cultivate in the strip they have guards down the side so you've just got that work soil for the crop your, your cash crop that would then be hopefully have much less competition i appreciate those issue of weeds coming in when you've cultivated anything but um I, I'm quite interested in seeing how that goes. You've got Dawn Agriculture and Soil Warrior over there in America that do that. Um, as far as sheep are concerned, definitely, as long as sheep make money, they've definitely got a spot on the farm. Um, when I did my trial, I gra sheep were in the field grazing the clovers when I planted. They had to get out of the way of the drill. They stayed in there until the crop was coming through. I then took them off. Um, this was about the end of October and then I put them back on again in January because the clover was getting excited and the wheat not so much. Um, they did eat the wheat, <laughs> unfortunately, but they also nailed the clover back. Um, if I'd had intero mow then, which I hadn't quite uh, perfected, shall we say, um, I would have used that rather than sheep at that point. But certainly to keep the clover, uh, clover grazed very tight down, I use sheep, um, but whether the new mix of the uh, uh, white clovers, wild ones, won't uh, be so competitive, I don't know. Um, yield loss all depends what the price of wheat or our cash crop is. If the price is low, then we can afford to lose yield because the price of inputs doesn't seem to fluctuate for organic farmers as rapidly as the uh, price of the product can do. So if you, you know, you're selling something one year for 300 pound a ton and next year it's 250 or 220 or whatever it might be, I bet your uh, fixed costs or variable costs haven't changed that much in that year. So it, 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 it's, uh, it's going to be a balance of, um, yeah, controlling your costs like Clive says, but also what the differential is between um, or what the price is of, of your cash crop. Um, but yeah, I think we've got to look after the underlay, make it a treat it like a proper crop and um, develop these interromos because if we're going to keep sheep whether or not the 
clovers will have enough grazing ability if we're using the very small ones, whether there'll be much there for the sheep to graze, um, and whether we need to be using a broader leaf one once we've learned how to control it, so the sheep have actually got something more to go at, or we have less sheep numbers. I don't know. It's all up in the air. Um, but um, yeah, it, it may work, but we'll wait and see. Hopefully everybody's got their different ways of doing it and we can all learn something from each other. Superb. Brilliant, Jamie. That, I think that really sort of, again, raises many sort of thoughts. I think that leads nicely. What I'd like to do to the next um, part, which I'd like to now um, get the, uh, bring in the other field uh, lab group members to comment on what they've heard, their experiences, their thoughts. Um, John, I'd like to bring you in, John Pawsey, first, because I know that you're just uh, a bit behind on time. You've probably got to leave us a bit in soon. So, um, John, if I start with you, obviously, um, you have Romneys in your rotation, you're using System Chameleon. Um, yeah, I know you, you've done a fair few trials in your time and tweeted about them. So over to you, John, what's your thoughts? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've got to go to um, half past. Um, yeah, my, my just sort of talk through my sort of current thoughts at the moment is that we're currently sort of mainly mint till, but we want to reduce cultivating uh, due to mainly due to drier springs, but also uh, weed reduction, uh, but also to increase our soil health. I mean, similar to Clive, you know, we started off in 1999 about 2.9% organic matter, and we're now to about five and a half. So a similar sort of raise in organic matter. And I think our soil's in pretty good health, but we can always do better. Um, uh, my 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 experiment really is the basis, as as uh, Jamie has said, is sort of based on strips of a living mulch into a strip or crop area. So the tilled area would be tilled as shallow as possible and hopefully around sort of four centimetres, but also could be hoeable uh, after harvest and pre-sowing, because in the absence of any chemicals, I still think uh, that I would prefer to have that tool in the toolbox if we uh, possibly could. Uh, but I, I personally do have real concerns for a uh, whole field coverage um, of a living mulch from a, a moisture, nutrient and weed control perspective. Uh, certainly, I mean, it might not be the same for everyone, but certainly in the drier east, uh, you know, we've had resulting yield losses uh, from cash crops in a really good under sown lay. And we've been doing that since 1999. So I know that they are real problems for us in the in the drier east. We're about 650 um, millimetres of uh, rain here. Uh, so we're currently sowing in 120 millimetre band at 321 millimetre centres. And the living mulch um, will sit in the 200 millimetre area between the cash crop rows. Um, my, my feeling, and this is incredibly naive, but I feel that, you know, we, we use the Cotswold uh, sort of living mulch mix, um, is that, you know, our idea is that we're going to put lambs um, on that straight after harvest to, to graze it and to keep it down um, pre-winter. And the winter then should keep on top of it until uh, we plant our next cash crop in the spring. Uh, but we could uh, revert, uh, revert to mowing if, if, um, if we had to. Um, so the tilled areas, you know, could also be stitched in when going back into a lay if that's what we do. But um, like Clive was saying, you know, I think we're going to be really re-looking really at our rotations um, if the living mulch works, because, you know, we might not have to have that uh, traditional uh, rotation uh, if we're building fertility all the way through it. So I think that's going to be really interesting just to look at actually how rotations work and sort of turn um, those on their head as long as organic farms and growers allow me to do that. Um, I think um, uh, that, you know, that the challenge of, of strip tilling um, in cereals, and Jamie uh, really alluded to this, is that uh, currently to, to get a strip tillage sort of cultivator, really they're looking at sort of, you know, 45 um, um, centimetre rows. Well, we want to do it in much narrower rows than that. Um, so we're currently talking to Claydens and George Sly at Horizon Agriculture about uh, building something. Uh, we're also talking to Gothia Red's cap about um, putting an opener on the front of our and a slight a cultivating disc on the front of our uh, system chameleon. They're sending them the drawing so we can make that. Um, so, you know, that that is something that we're looking at doing um, starting uh, this spring. Having said that, and when I say starting this spring, because we're looking at our under um, living mulches that we put in this year. So uh, the first 50 hectares we put in of a living mulch of the Cotswold mix 
Um, we undersowed it in winter wheat and pretty much all of that was wiped out by frost. I looked at it every day, which is always a massive mistake. Uh, but every every morning when a little bit more clover was coming up after 20 millimetres of rain after sowing, I thought, you know, ideal conditions. Uh, it just got burnt off by several morning frosts. Uh, we've got 20 hectares left. Sorry, there's a little bit in there, but not very much, not, not enough to, that really sort of pleases me. Um, but we've got a further 20 hectares that we undersowed in spring triticale, and that's still sitting there uh, as it's not germinated yet due to the dry weather. So that, that's just a brief run through of um, my, my thinking on the sort of living March thing, having only just sort of, you know, uh, got involved with the group. Um, but um, yeah, sitting on a cultivator for four weeks spring drilling really honed my thoughts actually to be quite honest pushing clods around is not fun brilliant john um john just uh, quickly before you go i know you know we obviously when you've come and spoken at some of our meetings you've um, talked about your sheep and the integration of your sheep on within your crops um is that is that still ongoing because obviously i think you're increasing your sheep numbers aren't you uh, we're, we're at about a thousand breeding ewes now, we're stopping there for the time being. But I was really interested in what Jamie was saying uh, because, um, you know, I was sort of thinking that actually if you present a, a flock lightly, lightly um, stocked on a field, uh, you know, what are they going to graze? Are they going to grow the, are they going to graze the clover or are they going to graze, graze the, um, the crop? And I think talking to Cotswolds, there's quite a bit we can do, uh, I think, in the future with these living watches, if you are using livestock to actually, um, you know, draw the sheep towards what you want them to graze rather than necessarily the crop. Um, the, the problem we've had with grazing crops in the past is, is that um, the stuff, um, well, I mean, they, they, it, it's, you know, the crop really needs to get away. I mean, you need to get it away to compete with whatever you've got, be it weeds or a living mulch. So, um, the, 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 you know, the least grazing on the crop, in my view, uh, uh, the better. So if we could develop a mix that would attract the grazing animal, whatever it might be that you've got, uh, that would be quite, a, quite an interesting thing. Brilliant for thought. Any, any other questions out there, Kat? No, doesn't look like it. I've got a kind of question that I'd like to ask, or, or send it, John. To, yeah, on, that's okay. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Um, I think I think we're oversimplifying when we talk about the um, this. You know, what kind of yield loss would we you know accept or, or suffer? Because we're considering very much the that single crop rather than the whole rotational um, that you know, finance of the whole rotation. So it's rotational gross you know, gross margin averages for the rotation that we consider. And I think one of the big um, exciting parts of this to me is that if we can grow, uh, if this could lead to kind of a, um, a more viable continuous wheat situation, um, because we're not just growing wheat, because we've kind of got those other species and we're not monocropping anymore, um, even with quite a significant loss, you know, if I, if I put two or three tons a hectare off my, you know, every year's yield, that would probably still work out better than growing those, um, you know, less viable break crops that we currently have to to get the species diversification. We've got um, a 40 acre trial here that's in year four, um, which is a continuous continuous wheat with a cover crop between it and it's a companion crop to wheat. And so far, we in four years, we're getting first, first wheat yields from that. So I think that's the bit we might be missing here, that this could be more and could actually open up the door to a rethink of rotations. That's a point that John just met, I thought was made was quite interesting. Yeah, I just 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 very quickly before I have to go is that my, my feeling, and I, I you know I might be completely wrong with this, but I think that you know there's there's two things. I mean, for, with with the strip chilling sort of concept, is that first of all it stops that sort of uh, white clover creep, um, and uh, and and also I I I suspect that there's going to be less of a yield um, loss from the catch crop if you are strip chilling, but. Um, yeah, Clive, I completely agree. I mean, you know, we, we've always judged our uh, rotation, um, uh, you know, uh, financially on the whole rotation uh, rather than just a single crop. Um, but, but obviously, uh, in an organic system, you know, we, you know, yield is still key because we've, well, if we've cut out all the inputs costs, but we, um, you know, may, maybe it won't be so key when we tackle all our fixed costs as you have done.
Bill, thanks, John. I know um, unless there's any, any other real burning questions, I know, John, you need to get on. I really appreciate your time. We all, you know, um, appreciate seeing you um, at this meeting. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. And it's, and it's really great to look at a screen and see pretty much all my favourite farmers on one screen. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, OK, all the best. Um, we'll move on um, because I'm just conscious of time. We're going to be a bit running over, but I think it's quite important um, this last bit to go through. Um, I, I'd like to uh, bring on Sam. Sam, oh sorry, are we are we going back to James Alexander? Update. Worth mentioning, um, James. It, Dom, do you have you talked to James at all? I have, an, I have an update from him. <sighs> We can we can move on. That's fine. Can we can we move on because I'm just conscious of time. I think um, it'd be good now just to move on. Um, Sam, sorry, uh, move on to Sam Lane or Marcus. Are we are we going to Marcus? Uh, Sam. Okay, sorry, we're going to Sam Lane. Sam, good to good to for you. Good to hear, see you on uh, at this meeting. Um, do you want to just give us an update on what's going on and your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I'll be quick because I think we've, we're short on time. But basically, just to give you an idea, the guys who have sort of joined the group a bit later as to where the, the idea and the mix have come from, um, we've sown in relatively small, sort of less than hectare plots uh, and under sowing mix for the last few years on Cotswold Brash, a traditional mixture of what was white clover, yellow trefoil, and been used for donkey's years. That worked well, sown in the spring, grazed over the autumn, and then terminated. The issue came when we were trying to then direct drill into it the following spring. We found that the yellow trefoil component, um, as some of the other guys or adverts have alluded to, was quite strong. And therefore then the idea of having just a white clover, the 70% low growing aberrace, and then a small amount of a small to medium, so the Aber Herald in this case, was to give you a little bit more competition to try and get some better weed suppression without obviously being too competitive when we're direct drilling into it the following year. So that's sort of where the idea behind the mix has come from. Uh, we tried it a couple of times in the spring, direct drilling the following year into that yellow trefoil and white clover mix. And because of the early nature of the trefoil, it was just too much, it was too strong. And that was spring oats, which we thought would be the most competitive, um, which again is why we've landed it on the, on the white clover only sort of mix. Also thinking that probably sowing it into a winter cereal or maybe winter beans in the autumn when the clovers are slowing down and opening up as it were, sort of opening back to the top of the soil rather than being sort of proud would be another way of trying to get our cash crop established reliably. Just last point on um, the yield penalty, which is interesting. We seem to be accepting there might be one, um, but I did see a slide from Andy Howard at Bog Hanger a couple of years ago on a presentation and he had sown just a pure white clover on a tram line in a wheat field and his combine yield mapping seemed to be showing a positive on the yield side of things. So just interested to see where we land with that in the end. That's Bill, Sam. That's that's great job. Thank you very much for that. Um, if we can, don't mind, I'd, rather than take questions, I'd rather just move on because I'm just conscious a bit of time. I think that's really uh, 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 leads in nicely to our next person. Um, I think that's you, Marcus. Um, obviously, uh, you, you're, you've got some experience. You're, you're doing this similar work yourself on your farm. Marcus, do you want to talk a bit about it? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yes, basically last year we had sort of sell crop rate um, instead of sort of putting a cover crop or anything. I've sort of opted to pop, try this sort of clover. Um, we actually drilled it at about twelve and a half kilos a hectare. Um, so we just went on with our Avidex machine uh, to drill it. Some places down one sort of corner of the field, it had, didn't establish quite as well, which uh, is sort of letting a bit of the black grass through, which is um, sort of a main thing for us for seeing what it can do on weed um, weed suppression. Um, drilled wheat into it uh, with a claydon using spoons. Um, drilled sort of after about 18 mil of rain, uh, very very well um, compared to the next field, which was almost like a pudding, which 
was after rape, um, not moved. Uh, going really well, really, really pleased with how it looks. We did start to get a few thistles in it, so uh, the left-hand picture we did um, sort of slightly curl the clover up uh, with some agritox, um, which has actually sort of suppressed the clover down a bit more um, and I think allowed the wheat and it has released a bit of nitrogen. Uh, we are doing some nitrogen trials across that field um, with the lowest one, I think, it's having about 60 kilos of nitrogen um, up to about the full sort of 200 uh, on the headland. Um, and since we've sort of knocked the clover, I'd definitely say that 60 kilos has um, changed colour. But uh, compared to the next field, which is just in standard rotation, this one's really looking a lot, lot better. Um, so really, really pleased with how it's going, quite interested to see. We've also, that sort of seven hectares field, I've put in another 30 hectares of white clover uh, with spring barley this year. Um, so we drilled it probably about mid-April and then we've got a horse joker with a bio drill mounted on it. Uh, we went over straight behind the drill, just tickling the top, um, sort of level behind the drill, um, put on the clover. Again, about 15 kilos a hectare and then rolled it. Um, establishments uh, a bit varied across the 30 hectares. Um, some heavier sort of soils are doing a bit better, and we are getting the establishment under the clover uh, or under the barley, and it's it's looking quite positive. A few other areas, I think, once we combine the barley, um, we will have to go back there with a bit of clover this autumn and sort of top up a few areas. But um, generally, on the whole, I, I think it's um, quite a good idea. The key thing we did um, to the wheat ground is we topped half of it in the autumn and that made a vast difference uh, our sort of wheat control and also how the clover performed. Um, I'd be interested this year in also grazing some um, to see what we get to. But very pleased. Brilliant. Thanks, Marcus. Brilliant. Marcus, have you got... Uh, Marcus, have sorry. Um, Marcus, have you have you got livestock? Uh, we haven't. We're purely purely arable, but we do have um, some sheep that graze the parkland. So we've got a sort of local farmer um, uh, that we'll sort of use, bring his sheep in just to run over it. Um, probably our top half of the field um, and graze the other half. See the difference. But where we left it and didn't top it or do anything, the the clover's not quite as dense. Um, and the real work. Have we lost Marcus or? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, one ah, final yeah. question, Marcus. Um, your yields. Question. What? What? Your what are yields. your yields? What, what, average your yields. Yield. Average yield. Uh, at the minute, um, this will be the first um, crop of wheat which will take off. From the clover field, um, so I sort of can't, don't sort of know how that will go yet. But comparing it to the standard next door field, which is similar sort of ground, uh, the clover's looking an awful lot better, um, and it's at the minute about two thirds of the nitrogen. Um, so it's yeah, sort of the 120 kilo, 150 kilo then uh, is looking better than the next door field, which has had about 200. Mm. Food for thought. Thanks oh, for that. Oh, oh, oh. Question, please. Oh, is is there oh. someone out there wanting yeah. to ask a question? Yeah. 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 yeah, sorry, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I missed it or whatever, but what type of clover do you plant? Was it a uh, uh, seed uh, uh, the small uh, white clovers, the wild uh, ones, or the uh, uh, we use the um, DLF Rivendell white clover. Sorry, Sam. What is that? A, is that a, short, a small leaf one or a big one? I think it's a small leaf one. I'm just had a look at that, but I think it's small leaf. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Okay, um, if that's okay, we'll just move on to. Um, Can I just ask to, a question? Sorry, Paul. Oh, sorry, Marcus. go on. Sorry, William. Um, 
Uh, Marcus, if, um, I'm interested in the rates you've used for your um, for the clover. It sounds like we we started about seven or eight kilos, which we'd use for trefoil, but it sounds like you've worked towards twelve and now fifteen kilos for for these small whites. And I'm wondering if you if you think that's the way that we should be looking, since you've actually made it work. It's uh, the difference. What made me go to sort of fifteen on this under the spring barley? has mainly been due to where we're um, not getting the weed suppression which we are ideally after uh, on the sort of first trial we had where sort of um, we didn't we probably went around sort of 10 uh, and it didn't quite establish as well so for me where we're sort of using it as a bit of a that sort of um, weed suppression I could do with it a bit thicker and I think we can manage it sort of there hopefully with a bit of wise if we need to um along with the topping um but yeah I, from what i've been sort of trialing i've been holding the rates up considerably to get that coverage okay uh, everyone i'm just like i say conscious of time marcus that's really interesting thank you i think it's really good to hear another's perspective and be able to see some pictures of what you're up to um brilliant and uh you know welcome to the group as well um and also to welcome our next person um william it's good to have you on the group um obviously as a consultant looking at it from the uh, different angle obviously meeting a lot of farmers i mean um what's uh their sort of thoughts on using alternative method methodologies and also reducing their fertilizer and, and chemical inputs you know by using these sort of strategies thanks Paul. it's 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 getting the economics argument over to people i think very a lot of people as clive said are just absolutely absorbed by yield because predominantly the fixed costs are still in many cases you know far too high um but it, i'm interested really as, Paul, as clive was saying if we can reduce the variable costs as well we know that fertilizer costs can come down with good soil management um and that's getting fairly well documented and yeah so i'm i'm very interested in the sort of the economic benefits from this because the profitability and the risk involved in these high input systems is just not worth it really um the economics for the the arable sector this year look absolutely horrible. You know, that was before we had a drag. Um, you know, but so we need it, you know, we need the data before we'll get widespread adoption of these new you know, innovative approaches. That's you know, that's where I come from, Paul. Brilliant. No, I think um, you know it's it's always handy you're out there seeing uh, what's going on on the wider scale, and I think that's very much the case. Um, I definitely agree with the variable costs. You know, we, we've concentrated very much on fixed costs, um, and now it's quite interesting on the benchmarking groups I'm running with farmers. They're actually asking me to go back and revisit variable costs now um, because they can see that uh, they've lost sight a bit of what's going on there, and that's going to be the uh, a quite an important aspect where they uh, change their their strategies um so thanks very much guys all of you for that i just really before i finish want to open it up for um just general uh, questions and discussions and alice um and anyone else that's out there from the press um please feel free to ask questions now just so you know alice had to had to leave um to go to another okay. meeting so she's no longer on the call right. but she found it very interesting so okay um unless there's any other questions from anyone um then what i would uh, say is that the whole idea of this was to just get the general gist really and everybody to meet but get the general gist of what was going on out there it's going to be a first in a series of meetings that we do it's unfortunate that circumstances have meant that we've all sat behind our computers rather than actually being out on a site maybe and uh, interacting that way maybe in the future that's you know where, where we'd pat where we'd like to be um what we're sort of thinking is that maybe another meeting um uh, post-harvest 
um, at some point at that, you know, but hopefully by then maybe we can get out and we may just have to social social distance, but maybe we can get out on somebody's farm and, and meet there. Um, just, uh, Dan, just a quick one about the slides that came up, because uh, obviously there's some quite interesting slides there. Will they be available for people that uh, are here in the meeting as well to, to um, have a look at and download if they want to see? Yeah, and we'll be we've, we've recorded this this uh, discussion, so we'll be considering that round as well. Um, but yeah, all the slides, I can send the slides around to everyone as well after, after the after this, definitely. That'd be great. Um, so really, for me um, and also the crew as well, that um, uh, you know, uh, and from all of us that have spoken, I'd just like to say, well, thanks very much for all your time. Thank you very much for being part of this project, which I think is, uh, as you all can. You all agree that it is an important way, uh, an important project, uh, important research to go forward, and something that uh, is very necessary and raise, will raise a lot of interest, I'm sure, within farming uh, communities as we go forward. Um, but other than that, unless there's some anyone else, I'd like to say thanks very much and uh, hope Question it rains. Question from Sam, it looks like. Question from Sam. Sorry, Paul, yeah, I know you're trying to wrap up. I'm just, just thinking That's ahead fine. on the sewing rate may become quite a big issue going forward in, in costings and all the rest of it. Um, is it worth anyone who hasn't sewn yet playing around with the rate on a pass or two and, and maybe you know upping it by a third just on one pass to see if there is a huge difference or, or not really? Yes. Anyone want to dominate? Are you there? Oh, hi, sorry, sorry, Paul. Yeah, um, yeah, that's. I think that's absolutely fine. If you want to, if you can still, um, you know, get yield results from that, you can do a strip big enough. Absolutely fine. If you want to think slightly with the, you know, the original seven and a half kilos per hectare, um, especially it makes sense with conditions of it. You know, changing your sort of sowing timing. Yeah, absolutely fine. Jamie, you're saying that you'll give it a go, yeah? Yeah, that's no problem, Sam. I'll um, definitely give that a whirl. I'll have a word with you about that, but yeah, definitely. That's brilliant. Shall we end it there? Because I'm sure you've all got things to do. It's gone on a bit longer than what I intended. I apologise for that, but I think, you know, everything that's come out has been really interesting. Thank you very much. Hopefully speak again in the future. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Great, cheers, that's thanks. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. Thank really good. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much.